Hi guys, I'm Christina. Hello. Hey, thank you for coming this morning. And um, thank you, Jasper, for organizing all this. So, 15 years ago, roughly, I was in London. I was a little kid, um, a small Asian girl in um, some English schools. And around that time, there's something called K-pop and K-wave and Hallyu. I don't know if you're very familiar with these terms. It was like starting to emerging. And although I thought this K-pop and Hallyu thing was very much our Korean sort of culture, despite the fact that I was in London, I could see that people were starting to pay attention to the music slowly. Of course, at that time, the, it was such a minor sort of thing, and it was almost like a subculture. And I wasn't, we were not very like proud, even though I was very Korean, because I also thought sometimes it's a bit cringy. And, you know, back then we used to wear all these like skinny jeans, very colorful, and neon signs, and then our hair was like this. So, yeah. I had no idea that 10 or 15 years later that I was going to witness this. So this is, you know, Blackpink. When Blackpink released their last album, um, which their title song was Shut Down, this was roughly about 2022 September. It's, um, this is the charts from Billboard, as you can see. And Blackpink was a number one on Billboard 200. And Social 50 was... BTS, and they had been number one for the last 210 weeks consecutively. That's quite a, quite a monopoly, I would say. Um, and Billboard Global 200, yes, again, K-pop, Blackpink was doing number one. And Artist 100, number one was Blackpink. This was something that I had not expected and I couldn't imagine back in my middle school and high school days. And around the same time, this is from um, 2022 October, this is a um, 20, this is a data from, from Twitter where they release um, what was the most mentioned artist in the last 24 hours. And at that time, you can see from top one to, yeah, 16, Everything is is K-pop. Bam Bam is a Thai guy, but then he works. He's in the K-pop scene. So in that top twenty, that's how much the global audiences and everyone was talking about K-pop. Although this is from Twitter, I used to live in China before, and even now, despite the fact that sometimes China and Korea has a little bit of a bad relationship, but then still on Weibo, which is the, um, the social media platform where Chinese people talk about things, you would always find something about K-pop stars in the top mentioned categories of stuff. So, what is K-pop? For those of you who might know it very well, then this might be familiar, but I would like to briefly talk about some of the things that we need to know in order to understand K-pop. So K-pop started roughly, I mean, the pop culture started around 1990s um, with probably you're not so familiar with all the artists up to first generation. Uh, this was more like a local kind of culture at that time. And in 1996, this is when, as many of you might know, SM Entertainment, which is one of the biggest entertainment companies in Korea, had established their entity. And these are one of the early idol groups of SM Entertainment. And this is when we started having this system of cultivating idol groups. I remember when I was in primary school, I was in Korea until I was in primary school, and then after school, there were like some of the kids were actually going to entertainment companies and labels as trainees. And I thought that was so interesting. I was a kid who would go to this, you know, math and English institutions. But then these kids, they were like going for dance and then singing and acting. So that's when it was already very, very active, that we were trying to cultivate young talents. 
And then from the second generation, that you might be a little bit more familiar. This is girls' generation. And, you know, Big Bang, that's, um, yeah, Big Bang was very popular in China. And also they were trying to get a bit more popularity in the um, US and Western market. But anyway, that's when it started. So we started exploring the Asian markets first, meaning that at that time, I mean, still, Jap Japan market is such a, such a big music uh, market. And we started penetrating into Japan and Chinese markets. And then from 2012, about 10 years ago, that's the third generation group, which now we still see them act, um, uh, are actively um, performing and they're releasing their albums like NCT and some of the boy groups uh, like from like Red Velvet and all these girl groups, um, they have started coming out and um, they start exploring more of a broader global fandoms. And then fourth generation is Tomorrow by TXT and Espa and these new groups, they are coming from the survival programs. So we used to have, you know, X Factors and Britain's Got Talent or Argentina's Got Talent and all that. I don't know, what do you have in here? Do you have Swedish, Swedish's Got Talent? Yeah. So we have that thing in Korea as well, but then we don't just stop at the audition. We showed the whole process of the tournament of how the trainees would be training and they're learning to sing and then dance. And then sometimes it's so brutal. These little kids, they would get all kind of feedbacks and comments, but then they're fighting, you know, with all that they have in order to become the K-pop idol stars that they have always dreamt of. So they have, um, after debuting from a survival programs, they become global stars that we know at the moment. And from this generation, we started seeing some interesting groups as well, such as ESPA, which now they have not only the real humans as the K-pop idols, but then some AI members in the group as well. Okay, so now, don't worry, I'm not going to read off everything. But then usually what a K-pop group, when, when, when you see a K-pop group, there are like tons of people. They're like, sometimes it can get up to 13. And then recently there was a group who, who has 26 members as well. And then you're like, okay, what do they do there? Are they, um, are, are they forming a football football um, team or anything? But then what, what the reason why you need all these people is that there's strategy behind it. You need dancers, rappers, vocalists, and visuals. So visuals are literally the people who are like, the prettiest or the most eye-catching. I know this can be quite, <laughs> quite um, controversial, but then still, K-pop has received all that attention from being so flashy and attractive. That, that is a, a thing that we cannot disagree with. So even from these different categories that you have like main, lead, and sub, depending on your skill levels. Um, so, also by naming different members with different positions, it makes all that, you know, a bunch of people easy to remember and give different focus and an emphasis to them. By doing that, different members don't just stop by releasing albums together, but then the visual members become sometimes actors and actresses or that they they are, they are the most active ones who are getting the money from advertisement companies. And then rappers, they also have survival programs and they, um, they go out and then they do their thing, you know, doing their hip hop and then they raps. But then all of that kind of comes back to the main group as well. And then that adds and, you know, creates a synergy to also sell their main albums and then promote their main groups as well. So now, then why is K-pop so popular, right? We need to figure that out. Why is this little country's culture became so popular? And I would say there are different categories, six of them I have mentioned, that we can have a look at it together. First is catchy and rhythmic music. I don't know how many of you are publishers here, but I know that um, 
my my boss and co-worker is for Echo. Oh yes, okay, okay, publishing companies, yeah. And when I was working at Cube Entertainment as an A and R, then um, we would be sending a lot of briefs to here and there, right? But then what we always had was catchy, catchy hook. So, of course, a song needs to be catchy in order to grab the attention. But then that was one of the most important things that we had to have in K-pop, in this competitive scene of every day, every week, there are just so many new groups released on the TV. But then, but then if you cannot grab the attention of the audiences right away, then there was no survival. Then you would your hard times and ease of training trainee times would be just gone. So catchy and rhythmic music, and we would also adopt different genres and different types of music into um, K-pop, and then the sing-along lyrics. It needs to be easy, sometimes it makes no sense, and then we would always have some English words. I know that was weird back in the times, but then we would say some silly stuff, and then they would pronounce the F word usually wrong, the R and L, and then it sounds just oh, so like horrible, but it still worked. You know, it's so, it's so, it's so fascinating sometimes. I'm like, oh my God, guys, like, we know how to pronounce F and P, but then it's just uh, during the recording times, thank you so much, you know, sometimes, yeah, that happens. But yeah, the sing-along lyrics, and then the dance break, of course. Like, you know, all the cool dances that people are doing. That the, the, the quality is not just like, you know, we all dance, right? You know, we go out during the evening, we go clubbing, and then some of us are really good dancers naturally. But then these girls and boys have been training like professional dancers for many years. And, you know, if they don't move in like, you know, the same sort of times, then they'll be penalized so much. So they really had to achieve that top notch standard in different things. And oops, sorry, the, the, the choreography I just um, mentioned. And then, as you know, the short forms are super popular these days. So these catchy and then um, fun dances are usually adopted for um, TikTok platforms. And then everybody's doing challenges for every single albums and the songs that K-pop idols um, release. And the choreographies are diverse. So do you know G Idol, which um, is a girl group from um, the um, the company that I used to work for? So I was A um, and R at the time for this um, Tomboy song, which was the most played Korean K-pop song in 2022. So as a single track, that was a really big success. And at that time, I was um, buying the choreography for our performance director. And then I was contacting different people. There's this guy called Kyle Tutin, who is the, um, the, usually the choreographer for Blackpink. And, you know, they cost so much just for the dance. It's like, it's usually $20,000 or $30,000. Like, you know, it's a easy, it's, it's a pretty expensive choreography. But then we would ask and then buy multiple of these Chore um, the dancers and choreographs from very, very, I mean, from world-class dancers and choreographers around the world, depending on your budget. <laughs> but, and then we would bring them together, and usually you would have three to five different choreographs, and then you would like cut and mix it together. You might think that this is not so authentic, but still, it's not just copy and paste, I'll just take that because that looks catchy, that looks nice. No, there's so much work that's put behind just in even the dance part. So that's how we make such a catchy and diverse choreography back in K-pop. And diverse talents. You see different members, Korean, Japanese, Chinese, Thai, usually. These, times, these days, you know, there are a lot of people who are like mixed. And unfortunately, I haven't seen that many Caucasian or, or, or members yet. But then we have all these multilingual groups who have different charms and attractiveness to different markets. And then they can communicate with different cultures very actively. And they are all trained for many years, once again, 
despite a lot of them, you know, even if they don't speak the Korean language, they would come and learn and just the culture and then the language and everything else on top of what other Koreans are doing. But then that diverse talents have created a group that you see now who are just so interesting that you can put out anywhere that they would be entertaining perform their, their performance level is great and they would be they would be doing all kinds of stuff that you probably wouldn't have seen before and the conceptual costumes and captivating visuals we put so much effort in creating something new every time so you need to always show different things in order to grab the ideas i mean eyes of uh, the, the audiences and especially the young people they're always interested in finding and then seeing something new in different people and this leads to fashion and of course the k-pop stars and idols are super fashionable and all of that least their, their trendy styles and also experimental styles on the stage have have created its own sort of culture and then the scene that it is affecting the K-pop industry in a positive way that it's grabbing the attention of also the, uh, the fashion industries to collaborate with K-pop idols. So storytelling, there are things, there's something called universe, which is um, Hegegwan in Korean. So this universe, when you say it, it's like, what is the universe? It's... It's something that we, um, the different groups, have behind their albums. So, for example, there's a group called EXO. They had a whole sort of novel-like book of thing that, that is about their universe. And then these different members had different sort of abilities. Somebody could, like, you know, the time warp, or someone was very strong. So it sounds, again, a little bit cringy, but then because by empowering these members and giving different, creating this universe, a story in the album, we were starting, we started creating albums based on the stories. So for the Western artists, a lot of the times it's like, oh, like, you know, like I had a, I had a super, super, you know, bad breakup or something happy and then some stuff were happening in my life. Then they would like, you know, have direct correlations with the albums a lot of the times. And then you would get inspired and they create the music based on your experience. But then it's different thing for K-pop because this is produced thing by a lot of different people. We had started plans, plans for different albums at different stages. So this album will be unfolding this part of the story of the universe. And then the next album will be this. And the next album will unfold this much of a story. And then later on, it becomes a universe of, of stories. And then the artists become the, the characters and uh, the players of the story. And the fans are so fascinated in finding out what's in there. And then there are like, sometimes it's like in this whole music video that is like so flashy, there's like, there's like a little cup. Or depending on the color of the small cup that was placed there, I don't know if it was intended, but then fans started digging in there so much. And they think that, oh my God, this cup, this cup is blue. And my favorite, my favorite, my favorite members has hair representation color is blue. So that must represent my, my member. And then that connects to this and that. So, you know, books are like that as well. Depending on the audiences and readers, it has different in interpretations. So we did, cre we created all that small sort of effects and elements to, for, for the fans to dig in and then, you know, have fun while they watch our music video and then while they just do talk to, I don't know what, if you know what that means, that, that means like you're like super into it, that you want to even like count the number of the hairs for your favorite like idol. So, yeah. So, again, the, the catchy lyrics, I mean, sorry, the, the music, choreography, diverse talents, <clears throat> storytelling, fashion, and the conceptual costumes are one of the main things that has made K-pop so, that, that has differentiated K-pop. Right, a little bit more technical, but now in Korea, the fans even understand that there are these major companies. And then 
<coughs> and um, as I said, in Korea, there are big four companies, which in 1995, the SM Entertainment was established first. Following 96, the YG Entertainment, where Blackpink and then Big Bang are now in. And later on, 97, JYP also was established, who twice and... Yes, got seven, exactly. And, and um, 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 yes, and then um, and, and Miss, a, Miss A and all these um, artists are in. And then this was, this didn't really exist until very recent. We were all thinking that these were the major companies and all of a sudden in 2005, they established Hive, although it took a little while for BTS to get attention, but Hive now is... The biggest um, is 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 uh, is the major company and the most globally popular one with BTS, and then comes down to some of the other ones like Cube Entertainment that I worked, and um, yeah. So in 2021, the big four's sales revenues was so huge. SM Entertainment, as you can see, 487 million. YG 247 with these members, and JYP, 135 million, and Hive, 877 million. As you know, it was such an year of BTS. BTS was everywhere, and then they were selling everything, but then they're not only selling the albums. They're selling everything they can, from, from the socks, from, from any kind of goods that you can relate to, with these members and with the company. And that's how they created such a huge revenue volume from these companies in 2021. And of course, with the wave and the momentum of K-pop going super well. So, globalization of K-pop happened. Do you know who this group is? Obviously, yeah, right, yeah. And do you know when it was? Yeah? Yeah, this was Coachella. So Blackpink did their Coachella concert, which is, um, to be honest, I haven't been, so, so I don't know how massive the venue is. And twice, this is, um, this is the Japan's variety shows and also albums. So they were going everywhere to do variety shows and doing different things to give exposures and to connect with different markets and then the audiences. And K-pop also started exploring the fashion brands. The fashion brands have different ambassadors, but again, back in the old days, we were, we were the ones who had to go and ask the fashion brands, can we please have a little bit of you know, support and sponsorship? You know, And then like all these very fancy ones like Chanel, Fancy, uh, Fendi, or like the top-notch Saint Laurent, you, you, you want your artists to wear them, but then, but then they were not so willing because we were not that influential. But then nowadays, everybody wants, wants a K-pop idol to be their ambassador. So you can see Louis Vuitton, this is um, BTS. I mean, and then they do multiple sometimes. And this is Lisa for Vulgary from Blackpink. And this is Kai for Gucci. Saint Laurent for um, Rosé and Dior for Jisoo and IU and Chanel. And, and um, Jenny is like the biggest Chanel ambassador across the whole globe now. And it is actually working. As you can see, two years ago, because by making Jisoo the ambassador of the Dior house, Dior had a 400% MZ generation sales increase. So, oh, sorry, MZ Generation sales was a big part of it, but then they had a 400% increase in their sales volume. This is remarkable, considering the fact that we're going through such difficult economic, you know, difficult, difficult times in the economy, and then the young people are just spending so much money on the luxury brands, and by having this ambassador, you have, it's a cheap deal. You know, for them, they don't have to do all the marketing plans themselves. The K-pop groups will do everything to do, you know, make their, create their exposures in every market. So for them, this ambassador is, is 
something that they can ask, you know, everything that they can ask for. And, of course, again, the China relationship now is not so good. I'm the only person who probably cannot go to China at this point because <laughs> I'm banned. But then you guys have Swedish passports and everything else, so feel free <laughs> whenever you need to go. Uh, but despite all that, still, China is... Um, we have so many fans in China. And then by having the K-pop ambassadors, we can target the Chinese uh, audiences and the consumers. But this is also important in that not in the volume of Chinese customers are so huge, but then the demand are very different from different parts of the world. They want very bold products and then they want logos full of everywhere. And then it's a good opportunity for fashion brands to diversify their products. And leading to TV and movies, K-pops also have created all that Hallyu and then K-wave culture, which has, which has also affected all these movie industries, creating a world around the world, the global uh, phenomenon in the whole cultural aspect. Anybody not seen Parasite here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You see? <laughs> I can roughly see that 50 of you guys are here, and then there's like so little of you that hasn't seen Parasite. I recommend it. <laughs> it's really fun. But yes, and these things are part of the cultural phenomenon that I wouldn't say K-pop has only created, but then that are just correlated. And then food you know, kimchi and then all these mukbangs. I thought mukbang, you had other words for mukbang on YouTube, but then mukbang is now a word that is used commonly everywhere, that people just show how they eat on YouTube. And then different K-pop stars, this is on BTS, this is Mamamoo, and uh, what's her name, Bumi from, from April, yes, and then Sonia Shide, Girls Generation, they are having all this food, and then you know they're increasing also the sales volume of the FMB business of Korea. Now everybody's eating kimchi, like this is like a break snack. So yeah. And and then it comes to fan industry, or it's also called fan economy. The real backbone of K-pop where it's all created, is because of fans. If we didn't, or if the artists didn't have fans who would support them like they're supporting, or, or usually more supportive than their own sisters and brothers, because you don't really care about them, to be honest, um, then we wouldn't be here. This fan industry is huge now in K-pop that at the moment, the global fandoms of K-pop has surpassed 100 million, and then now they have officially, um, the official number of fan clubs are reaching about 2,000, which they actually act as a, as a, like an entity, a small group of community who, who do a lot of interesting, un interesting things like organizing products, organizing um, different trips, and then so on and so forth. So all of that is created by fans voluntarily. The, fan, the fandoms are not created and then the, the events may be organized, but then usually the activities are organized by the fans themselves. And you can see here, BTS Army has fans spending an average of $1,400. When you consider the fact that these are very young people, usually, that they don't have so much spendings, like extra spendings. You know, they need to pay for their McDonald's and they need to pay for their, their shoes and clothes and they don't have so much extra money, but then they're still so willing to support their, their, their artists, not because they have to have to, but then because by doing so, you feel that you're connected and then you are just... You're, you're really supporting your artists to make them grow and then make them just, just great. And then it's almost like, like a game as well. By participating, having a direct contact, that you, 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 you have more um, channels to communicate with them. Also, you are like a producer yourself in a way. 
again and twice from JYP is, is almost a little less than half, but $800 is um, the av average spending. Blackpink and $600. $600. And you can see that these are the, 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 the little, um, what do you call it? I don't Yes, yes, the, but I don't even know, like, you know, it, why you need this sometimes, <laughs> because it's like, I used to play with this kind of things when I was very young, but then you would have different fans, um, different um, types of these um, sticks for different fandoms. And when you go to concerts, sometimes you have to have them. So there's, it's, it's expensive to buy them, first of all, they're usually like, although they look like $5, they're usually like more than $20 or $30. And I, um, if somebody pays me, yeah, $20, I might hold it somewhere, a little bit like shy like this. But, but yes, um, and then there's even like, sometimes this is so difficult to get that there's like a rental culture as well. When you go to a concert and you're a black blink, I mean, you're not a blink, but then you want to go to the concert and you want to stand, but then you don't have that thing then you will rent it from the real fans by paying the money, right? I was like, what? <laughs> I need to even pay the money to rent that thing? Okay. <laughs> but that's what's happening now. And BTS has also tapped into education. This Korean learning book that is created by BTS is, is I don't know, has anybody seen it? Anybody learned Korean with this? I have a Swedish, a Chinese husband who is actually holding a Swedish passport, so he's Swedish. <laughs> and you get that he doesn't speak Korean, right? And one day I went home and then he was like studying something, normally he doesn't. And then he was saying, Chanin <laughs> Ami meaning that I am an army. And then I was like, <laughs> What are you learning? <laughs> and then he showed me, this is BTS, learn Korean with BTS. And then, and then he was also like carefully drawing something on the paper. I had a peep. And then it said, Jungkook is one of the members. And it said, Jungkook, Guan, Saranghae. <laughs> like, love Jungkook and Guan. So it was a very interesting scene for me. <laughs> Yes, so I wouldn't say that you can learn or you can be very fluent with Korean with this, but then still, it's it's very it's pretty well made book, and then a lot of people are actually purchasing that. And obviously the goods that you would buy um, on top of all of that as a basic stuff. And these are the 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 shops that we have in Korea. We don't have it that much these days that everything has moved to online. But then um, when you go to these um, shops in Korea, then you will see all kinds of goods related to your favorite artists. And as you can see here, nowadays it's not just Koreans and Asians and Japanese um, people who are standing the groups, but then it's, uh, yeah, you can see how passionate they are in supporting their idol groups. And don't worry, we're reaching to um, almost the final of this part. <laughs> so stay with me. And what was really inter very interesting was that fans would even fund, create their own, I mean, create the funds within that group to support their artists in such a big scale, like paying for the billboards. So this is actually in the US. I think this was Las Vegas or LA. And then, and then, one of the people from um, Big Hits and then Hive, you know, they saw this and then they asked like, oh, and then what's going on? Like, when did we have a budget for this? <laughs> I don't remember one of the guys were like, oh, I never really like, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, yeah, there was, I don't, as far as I remember that we, we were not planning to spend so much on this billboards to, to have this BTS V, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, V's um, face on the billboard. But then what they found out was that the fans paid a huge lump sum of money to just stand their idols. This was happening, this has been happening all the time in Korea though. You go to, have you been to Korea? Korea? Yes, yes, I know. Yes, I know that you have been. If you go to Korea and then if you go to the underground, then you wouldn't see, you would very, you would see very little of the pharmacy or like, you know, some telecom 
billboards, you know, the, 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 the advertisements. But rather what you would see is that these K-pop idols, they would say, happy birthday, someone. You're the most beautiful star that is shining in the whole universe. Please stay in my eyes and hearts forever. Something like that, yeah. So you would see that like everywhere in Gangnam, especially, and then just, just everywhere. So this was not a new thing for us, but then, hey, hang on a second, like this is a different scale and different level. So, so and I don't know exactly how much it costs to um, put, put the, the billboard in, in the US, but this is what is happening for the fans, uh, what has been happening and what is happening now uh, between among the fandoms that, uh, yeah, they, they are doing to support their idols. Right, so Scandinavia and K-pop. I really, really wanted to talk about this because behind all this, you were part of it. We didn't do it on our own. But in fact, K-pop, the, the many of the titles were created by Swedish, Norwegian, Danish, a lot of the Scandinavian songwriters especially Moa, who we'll be talking later. Oh, she's there, yeah. <laughs> she's the most popular vocal in Korea behind all the songs. So how did this happen? How did, could you have penetrated into our K-pop, like so, so just, you know, you just like invaded that whole, you know, back market of songwriting? Let's figure out. So in 2005 and 2010, in that first phase period, we started buying songs from Nordic countries. The complete song. That was around, yeah, when I was in middle school, when um, we were doing tectonic, do you remember? Was it popular here? Yeah, the French tectonic dances and all that. And then Europop, something called Europop was super popular. We would be like, ah, oh, the song is like Europop. Then we started having different sounds in K-pop from that what we knew. And that's when we started having the songs from like Echo, like, you know, so the, the girls' generation, when Robin sold all that songs, we started hearing something different. And one of the very popular songs that started was Girls' Generation's Genie, the, the, the song that goes like this. Yeah, I don't know if you know. <laughs> yes. And then, um, so SM was buying the song very actively from Europe. And then the phase two is... From 2011, we started paying attention. Okay, if we want to be different, if we want to target more global market, we cannot just have the Koreans, you know, and then we also need to figure out and make it perfect with the people who has created the new sounds. So we started visiting Nordic countries and participated in song camps. The a and from Korean labels started coming here and then asking for the briefs and then actively communicating with the songwriters in this region to make the perfect K-pop song. Although you are already making really good songs all the time, but still, as you have seen, because of these different parts, the Korean song must have a rap part the dance break, the catchy hook, and blah, blah, blah. It needed a slight alteration to cater that format. So the a &Rs came, and then they were making and then doing it all together. And then they had the Song Expo, Song Castle, and Camp Fantasia. All of these different song camps were happening in different parts of Nordic countries. I don't know if you know this song. Yeah, 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 I see. Yeah, yeah. So this was the song that was written during Soul Calling, which was the first song camp that happened in Korea. And this song was not just written, but then it got sold to SM and then it became a huge hit because it was also sung by a very successful group called EXO, as you saw. And they created Echo Music Rights Europe, this um, establishment of a company, uh, uh, um, a publishing company that was um, co-founded by Suman Lee. By doing this, they were, they were just 
having a lot of supplies of the music that you are creating directly to the K-pop market. And then now, when you see the songwriters for the, a lot of titles in K-pop, I don't have the exact data, but more than half the times, you will see the this, this, uh, Scandinavian songwriters in the credits. And when I was an an r in Cube, I would always, I would contact all of these places and then we were getting hundreds and hundreds of music in different styles. And then what's so special about you guys and the reason why we became, we just sticked with you more than the US guys, although we still have some relationship, I don't want to say <laughs> bad things. But then the thing is, I heard that US people were maybe sometimes a little bit, they would have a little less understanding of the needs that we wanted. Sometimes, a lot of, a lot of the times we need to make alterations and we would ask for small changes. But then I know, as a songwriter, when you get that comment, it might not be very pleasant all the time. You don't want to change it. Like You would think they're like, who are you to tell me to change my perfect song? But then... Scandinavian publishers and the songwriters just were, were having good understanding of K-pop and then they were creating the perfect songs for our artists. And then phase four, COVID hits and we couldn't do the um, physical song camps much and we were having all this digital and online song camps. Nothing was stopping K-pop artists and then the songwriters to collaborate to create and then continue this K-wave that was happening globally. So we were writing, not me, but then the songwriters, were writing songs um, in, in, this, uh, in distance. And then they were, when the borders finally um, opened up, different songwriters were visiting Korea. And then I know now that there are some songwriters who actually reside in Korea. They have moved, moved to Korea to write the songs and then sell and create this relationship with the, the labels to maximize their, their sellings for the, for the, for the um, company. And before, we were always the ones who would think that you were the best at making music. So we would be always asking you for your um, tips and, and, and um, your, um, your, your, your things. But then nowadays, there are, because of all that hits that we have created, Kenzie and Yu Youngjin and P-Dog, these are the most established songwriters in Korea. So some of the songwriters would come to Korea and then work with them as our in-house in -house producers and songwriters. And these people would be the ones who would give them tips and then also provide the knowledges to, um, to maximize the songs to be successful. Okay, lastly, what we always want to know is what's gonna happen. I don't know. Well, <laughs> that's something that I or nobody can know. Nobody knew that crypto was going to bust like this crazy. <laughs> so, so the future is a big thing. But I want to tell you what's happening in Korea now. Obviously, metaverse, AI, avatars, and virtual humans are the keywords that you hear everywhere these days. NFTs, were very, very like, I would like work in cafes and also like different places and co-working places. And in Korea last year, everyone around me was saying something about NFT. It was that, that um, popular. And in Korea at the moment, the startup scene is going extremely active. When I was in China five years ago, oh, hang on, no three years ago, and then um, I was also in China longer, but then um, that was when the Chinese startups were going super crazy. They were creating something new and the government was supporting, and then they were, they were just, something new was happening and there unicorns. I used to work in a Chinese unicorn and then unicorns were happening here and there, everywhere. They were getting all the spotlights for the technology. But then, unfortunately, you know what's happening now. That's not happening anymore in China, but instead the momentum has come to Korea now. There is something called CES, since we're from music, we might not be very familiar. It's called Consumer Electronics Show, which is the biggest 
a startup and um, electronic show in the world that happens in the US that um, all the software and then you know the, the, the consumer electronic goods uh, people with the most cutting edge, edge technology would come and showcase their products. And this year, in 2023, which was very recent, my Chinese friend went there and then just called me. I was like, hey, it's, 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 it's all Koreans here. <laughs> this is US, but it's all Koreans here. Out of the 3,800 3, companies, 500 of them were Koreans. And then a huge about 100 of them got the, the best innovation, innovative idea re, um, award. So why am I talking about all this? When that technology just evolves, then they need something to showcase and apply their technologies to. And because Cape, the metaverse and then AI and virtual humans, these things cannot be talked separately with entertainment and arts. K-pop is a great outlet for these technologies and then the companies to showcase and then collaborate together with. Even before, like ESPA, as you know, had their virtual girl groups. So ESPA is a girl group that, is, that consists of eight, and then four of them are the real humans, and then all of them have a correlating same a um, uh, uh, virtual member who represent each one of the real humans. This was a new idea back in the times when it first was released. But then now, we're in 2023. What we are seeing now is blockchain-based K-pop group Triple S. This is a super, super new group. What's special about this group is this is the group with about 23 members in. But what they did was they created a platform where the fans could vote to create the subgroups of the big group. Not only that, they were carrying out voting, so it's a voting tournament to, for, for the fans to vote for which song should be the title for their album. So this was YouTube. Everybody, anybody can listen to it. But then if you want to have a vote, then you had to purchase a vote, um, which, is, um, which is an NFT. And by using that, you could vote and have your voice um, to, to choose which title, title song would be for their album. So they would have NFTs, obviously avatars, and wearables, and then all the goods. But they were selling it online as NFTs. The next, as I mentioned, honestly, can you tell? Yes, you can. But, <laughs> but still, when I saw that picture, to be honest, for a second, I have a pretty bad eyesight. If I see it from like here, I would, I would probably think, isn't this real human? But no. They are the AIs. So this group called Mave is it consists of all AI um, 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 AI um, virtual humans. So they don't only exist on YouTube. But what's interesting is that they have showcased and debuted this group on something called a uh, show core music. It's one of the uh, uh, the variety. It's a music shows like M Mnet. Uh, sorry. You have MTV in Korea. Some of you may have visited their shows. We have this show every week in Korea. And then this is where usually the new K-pop groups would do their debut performances. So they actually were so bold that they would just have this AI group to debut on the real just, you know, broadcasting show, which when you just see it, probably we can't see it with our eyes, but then the system was exactly the same. And then they had, they were the most, they had the most views for, um, for, for that week's performance, meaning that people are not anymore thinking that this is weird. 
they they are like accepting the reality that we're pivoting more to the AIs and 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 for the younger generations, obviously, we are relatively more mature than them. But we're not so used when we're not so used to seeing just the AIs thinking that oh, would I have much connections? Would I have more much much empathies with them? But the younger generations are very different. They think that why not? If the music is good, if they're attractive, if they're doing something fun and interesting, why, why, why wouldn't I stand them? Because they're AI? That's bullshit. So when you check their YouTube comments, there's a lot of things that are positive and generate, this new generation is very open and accepting to technologies. And this is the, the show on the TV that they um, created. And if you just um, type it on YouTube and then check out, their movements are very delicate. It's, it's no longer that, um, like, you know, GTA, I don't know if you have played. Yeah, <laughs> it's not that. It, they're extremely, extremely delicate and they're very realistic. And then they even take or created a picture that looks like they took it in a training room Obviously, they didn't have to practice hours of hours, <laughs> but then <laughs> they created this group as if they were actual people, and then they're creating that, that concept. So this is where we are. This is not 2030. This is today. They already debuted, and this is happening right now. And um, before I finish, I just want to say something again. I want one thing again that although I have mentioned about how and what was what were the things that were behind K-pop that made it so popular, I still believe that the core thing is or was and is going to be is the collaboration. We were open to collaborate anyone and in any industry and with in that in that center you guys played a such a huge role so k-pop is going to be or is it going to flourish like this golden age that did we whether we saw i don't know but still this industry where you, also, you need to continue to participate and also be interested in it because we want to collaborate and we know how powerful the collaborations can be and what kind of results that we can bring. So I'd like to say thank you to everyone for listening to my um, presentation and let's continue to do something more fun and more exciting from now on until the end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh. Amazing, amazing. Sorry, forgot to mention one thing. Yeah. Sorry, 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 sorry. Just scan the QR code if you like. This is a company where I'm working now. It's um, called Spark. So if you're interested in finding more about me and the company, feel free to check out and contact me via LinkedIn or anywhere if you wanna chat more. Yeah, thank you. Maybe some uh, questions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> stay, <'Cause>... stay. <laughs> uh, well, yes. Here's one. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm the founder of Online Music. Thank you for your presentation. I was wondering, what do you go by when uh, determining which uh, more publishers to work with? Do you go by the roster, the songwriters? How can we make your life easier as an NR? And also, I would like if you could share some insights on the relationship between American and Korean labels today and our collaborations between them go about. Okay, thank you. Sorry, what's your name again? Hampus. Hampus. Oh, my ski instructor was a Hampus two, <laughs> two years ago. I'll remember your name. Um, thank you for your que um, question. So, um, how. What do we do? How do we select the, the publishers? The main thing is obviously the rosters. We don't just go by the names. I mean, to be honest, but this is such a personal, and then um, every company and every A&R's processes could differ. But then the most important thing is the credits, where you have what are the songs that you have released with K-pop artists. It's, it's, um, 
of course, of course, you could have released uh, good songs with other artists, but then we always look for the credits of K-pop groups from these um, publishers. So what we normally say to um, different publishers from um, different countries is that, I know you want to sell songs to Blackpink and BTS and all these like, you know, mega groups. I know you, you, you think that your song is just so perfect for that group. But then in order for you to get to that point, then try selling your songs to the a little bit less popular, but then you know, still the K-pop groups and, and get your credits just just have your credits ready and then pitch that also to the A&Rs and then the labels, then you will have a much greater success in getting their attention, usually. But we don't just like say, um, like, okay, because this is a biggest company in Denmark that I will contact. Well, that can all be also, but then again, most important thing is the credits. And it's not a losing game. Even if you sell your songs to not Blackpink, as you can see, the sales volume of a lot of K-pop groups are very, very high, although they might not be as popular as Blackpink and BTS. So a lot of the times you might be able, you, you probably have a pretty big sales volume and then the royalties by selling the music to them. And the second question, which was on um, the relationship between US companies and um, the Korea, unfortunately, I don't think I can give you much insight. Yeah. Um, Thank you, though. Any other question? Yes. In your experience, uh, what is the biggest difference between a Korean writer and a Swedish songwriter, or like an American songwriter? Like, what is the what differentiates the way of writing music mm -hmm. for the Korean market in your experience? Um, very good question. I think I need to answer this very, very well. Uh, <laughs> obviously, um, different writers. Again, they're very, very individual. But then um, American, they, we still have more, um, more songwriters who, who are popular in Korea in the Swedish market. So we have more like, we're more familiar with like Moa and, and um, some of the other guys like Alexander or, uh, uh, yeah. But then for the American songwriters, um, they're coming and they're selling more and more nowadays. But then I would say it's more familiar for us to work with also the Scandinavian songwriters and um, Korean songwriters. Korean songwriters. I haven't really bought songs from Koreans recently, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. But um, the way they work, uh, um, what do you say? Actually, I think you might have some more insight. No, Robin? The, it's very yeah, it's very individual. It's also a cultural thing about doing collaborations. They do collaborate, same with Japanese writers. Uh -huh. You know, very, they they write your song. Mm -mm -mm. Oh yes, in the past, Koreans wouldn't really, really have that concept of collaborating, and then um, because Korea has a lot of hierarchies, so if you are like one year older than me or two years older than me then I would feel that they're much more senior than I am. So it would be more like I'm writing for my whoever senior to help, but then it wasn't more, it wasn't really collaborating. I would be like learning and then getting some comments from them. So it's um, in that sort of sense, the way that you write and collaborate are very different. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, hello. Thank you. I'm a PhD student and a researcher at K4 mm -hmm. in the Rundu University, which is the southern part of Sweden. And uh, I'm really curious about the fun chants, the audience engagement in the K4 concert. Mm -hmm. For example, the G Yoja Idol, yeah. and the fun chants would be like the Mi Yong Mi Ki So Yong Mi Ki. Ah, the, the chants. Yes. yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. How, how it's planned and who makes it. Oh, okay. This is, a, this is a question that people who actually really, really know about the culture can ask. Thank you very much. What's your name? Uh, my name is Naoko. Naoko. Okay. I forgot to ask your name. <laughs> but um, 
The chanting, yes. So, Mian, Mian, or like just the names, uh, you don't have to plan that much. So the names you don't really plan. But then actually, if you look at, if you search for like, fan chanting like Ungwan song, meaning the supporting sort of phrases, the company uh, company actually creates this um, supporting phrases. So when they sing a song, the fans actually sing together with us a lot of the times. But it's, it's like, you know, if you sing us one phrase and then they would sing the next sort of like word or they would sing, say, the names of their favorite artists or everyone's name in a row. So this is actually planned, planned by a company. So we actually create them. And then if you search it on YouTube for each sort of fan chant, your um, artist will um, tell you there's like an educational video of it every time. So they will sing the song and then tell you how to chant together. Actually, I had to, um, I have an experience of recording the fan chanting <laughs> because, um, because it was like during COVID when um, G Idol released their albums and they had to go on this TV show. And then TV shows, you usually would have that fan chanting when you see it. But then obviously you don't have the fans there because the audiences were not allowed. But so I had to go into the studio and then I had this paper and I was like, me on. <laughs> Obviously I was like very much more um, passionate, but then we have that planned, yeah. Was that a, what, did, they, did it answer your question? Okay. S sorry, Ampus? Yes, uh, I was wondering if I understand correctly, so the album concept stemmed from the uh, universe mm -hmm. part of the band, mm -hmm. groups. How do you as an A&R um, produce like a cohesive product if you take songs from a multitude of different songwriters from all over the world. What is your thought in, I don't know, making like a red, who sings with a draw to what? Mm. A red line, like from, uh, how, how do you choose all these different music? Ah, uh, you mean that is cohesive to exactly. the universe. Do, universe. do they have, do they like, not necessarily sound the same sound or anything like that, but if it stands from a concept, mm -hmm. how do you go about choosing music from such a variety. Mm, so mm. Very good question. Thank you, Hampus. Um, yeah, so first of all, not every K-pop groups have universe. So some of them they don't have, and then some of them who they have in this case, then um, you don't have to stick with similar styles all the time. You need to consider different, a lot of different things for an album to be successful. One thing, if they have a universe, then yes, they need to consider the concept, and the song needs to match the concept in the universe. Or, for example, if you're planning for your A artist's next album to be in like a girlish, powerful, and if the background is like desert, then you can adopt some sort of like mumba or like, you know, some sound that has that elements in it. So we would also have the concepts first if, if, if we really want to stick with that universe. Then based on that, we would have the briefs sent to, to different publishers. So we would be um, receiving not too much surprises. So among that, we will make the best selection out of it. Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question? Uh -huh. In these briefs that we as publishers receive mm -hmm. from, from you guys, I was wondering if there's an X factor, because if, if I'm in your position, let's say, uh, when you work with you, and I get like 100 songs that mm -hmm. pretty much all sound the same according to the brief, mm -hmm. are you instinctively like looking for something that sticks out? With it? Oh, that's um, it's. I think that's uh, that's. Well, of of course. All right. Okay. Yeah. Usually, yes, you want to um, follow the brief, but then if this, if you find a song that is absolutely just banger, then you would consider like, okay, why don't we make a little bit of changes to the album concept? Or we would say, uh, we want to have this song, we plan to have that song later on, release it for different periods, because you, you don't have to release it at that period of time. Um, yes. Right. One more question, I think we have time for it. Yes, hello. Hello. 
Uh, my name is Karin. I'm an artist and I also write a book about music and neuroscience and things like that. But I have, this might be a side question, but uh -huh. uh, I have a, a question about artist integrity. Mm -hmm. Since a lot of times the, the creativity comes from the, the artists themselves, and it sounds like K-pop phenomenon is much more of a management team mm -hmm. effort, so to speak. Uh, is this discussed? What does the artists themselves think about? Are the game rules different, so to speak, from other types of artistry? Uh huh. Okay. Um, yes. So usually, you know, these um, groups are groups composed of very young people, and of course young talents have their own ideas and then you need to respect them but like you said we need it we need a whole team of people to produce and then create a product an album with the best dancers the music and so on and so forth so usually what happens is that in the earlier stage of their albums and their debut there will be more um, engagement and then um, opinions from the, the production side. But then slowly, gradually, when they also gain a little bit more experiences and stuff, they would have more voices to um, their albums. But then you always ask the artist, we have created um, this concept and then um, probably, I mean, this is going to be our title. Um, what do you think? We will ask them and then they might not be able to say no. I'm going to choose that song. <laughs> but still, we always try to share with them what's happening. And um, a lot of the K-pop artists nowadays, um, in 17, there's the Hoshi and then Soyeon from G Idol and, um, and the Stray Kids guys, they're writing their own songs. They're not just writing the um, other, like, they're writing actually the title songs themselves. So there are groups who have this producing and production ability, like they have their own ideas, and as well as the groups that they need a more of the management um, engagement. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's what's happening. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Christina, again. <laughs> Thank you.